Before we welcome our guests, author and lawyer Pauline Campbell, I'd like to discuss and look at injustice in society on a whole. What do we consider as injustice? By definition of injustice, it's an unjust or unfair act that violates the rights of another. It's a lack of equity, a lack of parity. Life isn't fair, and that quality is exactly what defines injustice. Something unfair that happens, often in violation of a basic human right. Now, in the early 19th century, in the United States, women could not legally vote, but they fought back against this injustice and eventually won voting rights. The word comes from a Latin phrase that literally means not right. And injustice is the opposite of justice, which is a fair and righteous act. Injustice can be general or specific, like the injustice suffered by poor people everywhere, or an individual act of injustice committed by some unkind person. Today, injustice for one is justice for another. When we think of Gary Lineker and comments on the government asylum policy with the bold crossing, one could say that there is injustice. Another would say there is justice, and that is just one example. We'd like you to join the conversation by commenting below on our Facebook page and on Twitter with the hashtag Silver and Serial Show. Today's Pauline Campbell. In addition to being a lawyer, Pauline recently realized her dream of becoming an author in the debut of her novel, A Touch of Templeton, and her latest, Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips. Welcome to the show, Pauline Campbell. How Thank you, you for inviting me back. Fantastic. Mm. Well, listen, in 2016, mm. ladies and gentlemen, 2016, Pauline graced the chair, the red chair, and we're talking about A Touch of Templeton. Yes, we were. Yes, as you can see. Now, the interesting thing now is that you've got this book now called Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips. Rice and Peas. Of, now, Pauline, I like rice and peas, but I like rice and peas with chicken. Can you explain to me where fish and chips come in with rice and peas? Well, <laughs> fish and chips doesn't necessarily come in with rice and peas, but yeah. somebody did tell me they do have rice and peas with fish and chips, but yes. I've never heard that before yeah. other than that one time. Yeah. But with this book, it's more about looking at the cultural mm -hmm. links between our society. Yeah. First generation born in Britain to Jamaican parents in the 1960s, mm. we grew up on two specific foods. For us, it was rice and peas yes. and fish and chips. Yes. And it's like the cultural link between the two. That's mm. what I mean by using that as a title. Wow, wow. And um, what have you learned, would you say, from your debut novel, um, which was Touch of Templeton? Because that was self-published, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And what I'm understanding from rice and peas and fish and chips it's not self-published. No, it's a traditionally published book along the traditional lines. Break it down now. Talk to Templeton at that time, because I remember clearly you're chomping the card for self-published and now you're published. So explain that. Or yeah, I mean, for me, the situation was at the time when I self-published A Touch of Templeton, it was a fictional erotic mm. novel and mm. it really did sell, but not uh, to, the, to the numbers I would have loved. Yes. And what happened with that was I made the decision at the time to self-publish because I suppose there's a level of naivety when you decide to publish your first book. Yes. Um, I think self-publishing is a fantastic idea. Mm. I think I'm glad I did it because it gave me a really good idea of the publishing world from top to bottom, right up. But what it also did was it showed my lack of understanding of marketing. Mm. Because if you're going to self-publish a book, you've got to have the full package in place, which includes the most specific and most important element, mm. which is marketing. Yes. And because I didn't have that skill in the way that I needed it, or I didn't have the contacts in the way that I needed it. The book didn't spiral out the way I wanted it to. Yes. I sold a, quite a few copies, mm -hmm. but it didn't take me to the level I wanted it to. And as such, I realized that the best thing that I, sh I should have done at the time was probably waited until I was in a better position before releasing it in that way. But, but with the touch of Templeton, can it be we 
redone again. Oh, it's, it's been revamped. Yes. It's completely revamped. The second one is done as well. Yes. So, um, uh, the second not self published. No, it's waiting. Um, but okay. the first has been done. Um, and now with this book, mm. it's a very different type of book. For a start, this is non fictional, it's yes. part memoir and part factual. It talks about us growing up in this country over the last 50 to 60 years. Yes. And it's traditionally published because a publishing um, publisher called No, no Bro, mm. No Brow Limited, actually put out a competition on equality. Yes. And they were looking for writers. And I was shortlisted for that. And once I got shortlisted, um, my book was the piece I wrote, which was 5,000 words, mm. was put into something called the London Reader. So I had to withdraw from the competition. Yes. But they liked what I'd written so much. They met with me, spoke to me about what I'd written and commissioned me to write a book about yeah. it. And hence, they did all the work and it's been formally published yeah. in the traditional way. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, rice and peas and fish and chips. I've got to say, I've got to keep looking at it each time by saying fish and chips because I, I want to say chicken. Uh, it's fourteen ninety nine, And in this, Paul and Campbell um, was brought upon rice and peas and fish and chips, as she said, so the opening, after her parents crossed thousands of miles, leaving the warm shores of the Caribbean to settle in Britain. And this book will take the reader on a journey into where her generation has been, a generation of people who at the birth had no idea that the subsequent political events that were taking place throughout their young and adult lives would lead to a tsunami of inequality. And in this vivid exploration of what it means to be British as a first generation immigrant child of Caribbean parents, Campbell also examined race and racism set against Britain. Pauline, in, in lis listening to this now, um, it's about injustice. Just talking about the opening, you talk about inequality, and you talk about the people who came. What, 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 what are you trying to get from this book now? Because there's a message, not just a book for book's sake. Yeah, I yeah. think I think for everyone that writes a book, they want mm. it to mean something. Yes. Um, for me, it was really to understand what went wrong, because mm. we were we were born in this country. We mm. speak the same language. We eat the same foods. We have our white friends. Yes. We we are children living in a country whereby we believe this is our home. Yes. It's the only home I've ever known. Yes. And I am proud of all who I am, everything about me. However, I realised that as we were growing older, things weren't the same for children who were black than they were yes. for my white friends. Mm. The rules were different. And what I wanted to do as I got older is I realised that school, my education, it didn't go the way it should have done. I was an A-list mm. student. I was doing all the right things. But the education system just didn't work for me. It, it failed me. In the UK, you're in talking. In the UK. Yes. And so what happened was when I got older and I finally managed to reboot myself and find a way forward, I had to go back and look at what's gone on over the last 50 mm. to 60 years in this country. And writing Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips really helped me to understand what did go wrong, the legislation that was in place, prominent politicians, the world in which we live, yes. immigration, which played a key part in everything that happened. It really came together with writing the book and it helped yeah. me to understand a lot more about our lives in this yeah. country. Yeah. And more importantly, it's introduced a lot of people, white people, who didn't know what we were dealing with yes. into this world um, by reading the book. They've been amazing in yes. coming forward and saying how the book has enlightened them in ways that they, they didn't expect it to, but mm. it's really enlightened them. Before we go on our break, I just, I just need to ask you one question because there's something you said a while ago which is very poignant and people might even pick it up, but I pick it up as well, reboot. You have to reboot yourself. Are you saying or implying that a lot of people in this country, black children, black people, brought up in the system, will have to go through this process of rebooting and understanding and transform like... Yeah, I mean, a lot mm. of us had dreams, dreams yes. which we, we wanted to be. My father, our mothers, our yes. family, a number of us went to school and were very bright as Caribbean children. Yes. And we had so much potential. 
but the system in which we were in would not mm. acknowledge that potential. For some of us, we were able to break through and become the doctors and the lawyers and the architects and the engineers. Yes. But such a minute number of us managed to break through because the system didn't make allowances for the fact yes. that the teachers we went to school with needed a better understanding of who mm. we were and we needed a better understanding of who they were. And had we had more black teachers in our schools, maybe things would have been different. So when I say reboot, yes. I mean lost opportunity the opportunity to yes. be whatever we wanted to be yes. was lost. And by the time you get to a certain age, you might decide I'm not going to try to change. I'm just going to yes. accept the situation that I'm in and deal with my life the way it is. So what you're actually saying is that just like in the graveyard where they say visions and dreams are resting or, or dissipating away, a lot of people are also walking with dreams which need to be revived. Yes. And be, resurrected and, again, and it's never too late to revive your late, dream yeah. because you are intellectual all the things yes. about you that make you real will come yes. together if you yes. just believe that yes things didn't go the way i wanted yes. to when i was younger yes. but that can't stop me from moving on to what i want to yes. be yes. now ladies and gentlemen that's powerful and i'm going to take a break right now and come back to pauline in just a few minutes thank you Today's show is brought to you by D. Marie Project Management. Are you looking to build a new website or business support? Working with you to empower your success. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. I've got Pauline Campbell here and with her book, Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips, One Woman's Story of Overcoming Racism. Very intriguing interview and the uh, first part was really powerful. Uh, Pauline, welcome back. Thank you. We meet again. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Listen, um, you're now, or to say, you're seeing your life somewhat unfold, like you're moving to a new level. Um, for me personally, you're sounding more fiery, you know, and as the, the topic which was injustice, and you recently announced on your LinkedIn that you are now being represented by Athena Advance. Athena Advance and Pauline, what does this mean? Because it seems like you're going into another a threshold that's been created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, um, so when the situation is that so much has been happening with the mm. book, and not just the book, I'm still a full-time senior lawyer mm. and I've still got a team to run. Yes. Um, and I'm doing lots of talks all over, all over the place. Yes. And I do workshops and I'm still working with Windrush victims mm. and things of that nature. So what's happening now is that I need some professionals to step in yes. and provide me with the guidance and the help I need to take me mm. to the next level. Um, and Athena Advance are, are that organisation. Yeah. They are a public relations yes. um, company who represent and do amazing things. Um, and what they've decided to do is they're, they're branching out into authors who mm. deal in social justice um, and they want to provide and do provide me with amazing support yes. in how I can take myself mm. to that next level, whereby I already talked to a lot of lawyers, I already talked to a lot of organisations, yes. but my aim is to focus on looking at the police, looking at mm. corporate firms, looking at lots of places whereby I can introduce not just rice and yes. peas and fish and chips but the concept of how we can overcome perceptions of people of colour and how organisations can build on inclusivity and, mm. and diversity and equality and equity and they are second to none in mm. helping me on that journey so I'm yeah. keeping my fingers crossed. Yeah. So, so what you're saying in a way regarding rice and peas and fish and chips and Pauline Campbell is that you're somewhat bridging a gap because you said previously that children were taught 
by people who didn't really understand them. And children also, and, and, and the people who are teaching them never really understand them in a way. They are doing the, the right thing in a sense, but never understand that cultural diversity. Bit. This is where you want to actually bridge a gap, isn't it? Yes, I mm. think what we need to do is we all are a part of this journey. Mm. And some of us are so hurt, have been felt that we just haven't been given a voice and are so isolated yes. that we don't say anything. We don't use our voice. Yes. Yes. But I've made a conscious decision that I am going to use my voice in the hope that others will follow me and use theirs. Mm. Because we need to bridge <clears throat> this gap whereby there is a problem with people working together yes. that don't understand each other there's a lack of seniority positions for people of color mm -hmm. there's a lack there's a massive there's pay gaps there's all these things in relation to seniority yeah. and we have to find a way to bridge that gap and if we work together we will be in a position to do that an example for me is I have recently written a piece for the New Law Journal. It's not printed yet, yes. but it will be. And it's about social mobility within the, the legal world, the legal profession. Yes. And it's wonderful that they're going to, to publish it because it's really important that we as black people mm. and anyone within the legal profession that has something to say about the lack of social mobility within yes. the legal profession actually says it and puts it on paper but in a way that helps us all to understand mm. a bit more about what we can do to make things better and this is what athena advance is also doing by moving away from the corporations but tapping into individuals who I say are corporations? Maybe they're looking at the corporations. Yeah, well, extent. what they're doing is they're, yeah. they're helping to give me my voice. Yes. They're helping to get my voice out there mm. with all the skills they have. Yeah. And that's all I can hope for. It's, it's early days, but so far we have really, really had some powerful mm. meetings. And um, Robin Heller, who is the president, has been amazing in helping me mm. focus and be clear, clearer on what I want to do. Yes, yes. And, and it, it's something that you need. You need a professional yes. who is outside of the process to look at you and see, okay, where are we going? Yeah. What are we going to achieve yeah. through this? That's very interesting. And, and the work you say with um, some new things coming up with judges and all those sort of things. Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've done um, is I was shortlisted for Legal Personality of the Year yes. for the Lexis Nexus Awards in 2022. Mm. And one of the finalists in my category was a judge, a High Court judge. It was wonderful to meet him at the awards, but what's happened, which is even more um, spectacular, is that I've had an opportunity to, to speak to him about my mm. concerns about the lack of diversity within the legal world. Mm. And we're talking about it. It's nice to talk to somebody else within the legal world about yes. something like this. Um, I don't know where we're going to go, what we're going to do, mm. um, but I've sent some proposals to him about how I think we need to make things, push things in a direction mm. that takes us to a more a better place of equilibrium yes. within the legal yes, world. Yes, yes. Where we're going to end up, I don't know. But what's wonderful is we're talking. And the most important thing is a listening happening as well. We're talking and we're listening yes. to each other. And it is not just in the legal fraternity because you saw that young chap recently in Oxford, that young professor as well. I mean, lots of persons are chomping and say, well done, um, first black man or so. Um, it's funny that sometimes when these things happen, we are saying first and we are championing and we are applauding. should be normal, isn't it? Yes. Um, Jason yeah. Arday, he's mm. the youngest professor at, at Cambridge, yes. I, I believe. Cambridge, yes. It's amazing. We yeah. all take our hat off to him and we applaud his success. Yes. However, one of the things I said um, and one of the things I will keep saying is... This is wonderful, but when you think about the number of professors in this country, there's yes. over 19,000 professors in this mm. country, only 160 plus are black yes. out of over 19,000. Mm. So why are we applauding something? It's as if with, with 
people of colour, when something happens, something as amazing as this, yes. it's as if we're happy to accept the scratch from the table rather than enjoy a hearty meal, which we're entitled to enjoy. Let's applaud Jason. Let's yes. congratulate him. But let's look at the whole picture, not just yes. individuals, because 160 plus is just really not yeah. sufficient for a country yeah. where the proportions of black yeah. people are a lot higher. That's opening a, uh, a lot, Pauline, and um, there's a lot more depths right there that we can go on for another time. And I thank you for putting that point up. But in, in the UK today, um, there's a fresh thing which is happening with the government asylum bill and the, the massive outcry regarding that. And I, in my opening, I said justice for some, injustice for some. What do you say about that? Um, mm. What well, It's in the book as well. Yes. It's history repeating itself. Yes. Um, mm. What I'm worried about is that at the moment there is a, a fear in this country and I'm not surprised we're dealing with a, mm. a crisis right now the cost of living is spiraling out of control yes. people are really struggling financially to survive they're choosing between heating and eating mm. this is where we're at right now and we're also having to deal with the fact that we're spending millions of pounds on the issue of housing and looking yes. after the asylum people coming here and looking for some kind of justice in this country. Mm -hmm. And they have every right to do that. But right now, I think that the language that's being used yes. in relation to people looking for asylum, it's not the best language that is being mm. used. It's not what is being done. It's how it's being done. Mm. And it worries me that we're going back and stepping back into time because people are frightened mm. and they're fearful of what this is bringing to this country. Yes. I think we need to be more cohesive at this time. And I'm nervous about yeah. how these people are being received yeah. in an environment where they're not being treated as fairly as they should be. It's interesting you said because a, a friend of mine, uh, actually a barrister, uh, had a video on his TikTok and he said that, is it a bit strange? Many years ago, they came for us in boats and they fought to bring us here in this land or the new motherland. And now they are scared of us coming over. <laughs> In boats. There you go. <laughs> in boats. But that was where he just had his, hmm, which is very interesting. Think history has, yes. a, has a way of repeating itself. Yes. It, in J it, Jamaica, people would actually be put on trucks. They would come, Britain, mm. people from Britain would come to the Caribbean in, and say to people, come yes. to Britain, we want you mm. here. Enoch Powell the health minister was encouraging people to come to Britain mm. because we needed to rebuild Britain after the war. The war. Yes, yes. So post-war Britain really needed our help. And so we are now in a place whereby the country is in a very different mm. place to what it was before. Um, and I cannot speak for the asylum those people mm. seeking asylum. I don't know their journey, but I do know that the language being the language, used in relation to invasion, which is what Gary Lineker was talking the about. The language well, being yes. used takes us back to a time whereby we feel uncomfortable with yes. that language and yes. we want people to think about what that means. Yes, uncomfortable period, uncomfortable words. Someone was saying to me the other day, maybe Silver, maybe one of the solution is actually recognizing that the world is one big place that there are no borders, and therefore let everybody go where they want to go. And surprisingly, surprisingly, they might not even want to stay at the places where they are find, trying to find now. You mm. know? And that's, that's something to be looked at. Now, the, the asylum bill, I, I've got to ask you this question. There's a quick one. You can answer it if you don't. Sula Braverman or Priti Patel? Pass. You pass? I pass. Well, I hear some people talking about, say, boy, I thought it was better with anyone than Priti Patel, but <laughs> some of them might say, bring back Priti Patel, <laughs> but you say pass. I say Okay, pass. okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and lastly, before we go, there, there's a massive report that just came out recently, the case report. But what I found interesting was the case report talks about misogyny. It talks about institutional racism in the police. It talks about homophobia. And I look and I saw the McPherson report in your bit here, Scarman reports and all, has nothing changed? 
No, literally, that's a simple answer. Mm. I mean, the problem that we have is that the Scarman report in 1981 mm. gave a blueprint yes. of what we need to think about in relation to trying to bring communities together, yes. white and black, how we can work with mm. the police to make the police a better service for those people that it's for. The McPherson report, and funnily enough, um, and it's not funnily enough, it's tragically enough, yes. we are now in the 30th anniversary of Stephen Lawrence. Wow. 1993, he was murdered. And the McPherson report came about as a result of that. Yes. 30 years on, nothing has changed. When an organisation is toxic mm. and you don't change it, it only becomes more toxic. Now we have the Casey report, mm. which is a third report, yes. which means it's a spiral. Things have just got more and more out of yes. control. And the reason for that is because despite everything that has happened, there's one thing that the police or let's say organisations have never really done once these reports have been written. And that is to listen. Wow. And reports upon reports upon reports, some of them are going to be, even with Anansi nest all over it, just piling up. We we but we need to look at being solution based. solution based and one of the things that i've done is that i truly believe that we need a police service we yes. need one we can't survive in a country without a police service yes so what do we do as a community do we just keep lambasting them mm -hmm. no what we do is i made a decision yes. and i wrote to the the mayor of london and i wrote to him about rice and peas and fish and chips and solution. i also Solutions, i wrote yeah. to him about Peter Imbert, who was a police commissioner yes. previously in the 80s, and what he did and the amazing things he was doing to try and change the canteen mm. culture within the police. I talked about how we as a community can work together with you to impact change. Yes. And um, to be honest with you, things are moving because they did get back to me. They said that they are sending my details on. The yes. Mayor of London said that they are looking at it. And I'm also talking to other police officers yes. because I really believe we can do something if you're prepared to listen to what yes. we have to say mm -hmm. and if we work together to try and impact change. So, ladies and gentlemen, one of the key factors is about listening. Reports upon reports... But reports by itself is just reports. Reports it? are just recommendations. Yeah. I, I note that Suella mm. Braverman did say there was something mm. about bringing in some form of legislation yes. to in relation to trying to home in on how they can fix yes. these problems. Um, well, I'm not sure about that yes. because at the end of the day, legislation can only work if people's mm. minds are adaptable and flexible yes. to change. Yes. And if we don't change our thoughts and our perceptions, nothing will change, no matter what legislation you put into place. Yeah. Pauline, we could keep going on forever because this is a very toxic topic and also it's a very um, a lot of revelation. How can people get your book? Well, it's on Amazon. It's everywhere. It's yes. in bookshops. Um, and anyway. I'll dare I say it, the yes. eBay, it's everywhere. So whoever wants to, yes. to get a copy of this yes. book, they can do so. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a, a one woman's story of overcoming racism, rice and peas and fish and chips. Finally, I've said it. I'm not, not chicken anymore in it. Rice and peas and fish and chips. Paul, I want to thank you so much for coming today. My pleasure. Um, and it was a pleasure and it was awesome. And thank you so much. And it's the second time on the chair. And of course we'll be going for further. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you so much for the show, for coming on today. And um, as you have heard, Rice and Peas and Fish and Chips, a powerful book, moving on from A Touch of Templeton, but something which is profound, which I got from this discussion, and it was the boot, the rebooting of the community, of people, understanding where you're from, where you're going, but also the persons who teach it and the persons who are being taught don't understand each other, even though, yes, they have been teached. You know, you're talking about that. And even with the injustice factor that um, Pauline talks about, Pauline talks about the different reports which have been made and done over the years. But one thing which is missing out of it is listening. Because when you, when you listen to the case report or hear about it, you're wondering, say, hang on a second, we have been here before. It's like deja vu. But guess what? The Silver Show won't be a deja vu. We will find solutions. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.